All right, um, if I can never get everybody's attention. So on um, the final talk of the day, um, we have uh, Evan and uh, Kelvin, um, who were at some point both at Tiala. Um, they were both very uh, sort of early members of the Spark community, and actually um, they sort of pioneered the uh, integration originally between Spark and Cassandra, and the guys been evangelizing about them. And today they're gonna talk about the job server, which is, uh, I think, arguably one of the uh, most wanted feature actually in the Spark ecosystem about how to actually have a server that shared jobs between uh, people. And there you go. <laughs> okay, thank you, Reynold. Um, how's everyone enjoying the Spark Summit? All right, let's, let's give a big hand for the organizers. You know, let's, all right. Um, so uh, today we're here to talk about uh, Spark Job Server, which uh, we worked on uh, for over a year. We're you know, very excited to bring this to the community because we believe this is something that uh, the Spark community needs. Uh, everyone needs a way of uh, deploying these jobs, managing them, and, and we're gonna talk about uh, how the Spark Job Server enables uh, specific use cases such as uh, running uh, queries, like running Spark as a, a query service, which is quite exciting. So. I'll let uh, my colleague, uh, um, ex-colleague Kelvin, uh, talk about, uh, introduce the Spark server. Thank you, Evan. So let me give an uh, overview first. Um, so uh, the job server was created at Uyala in the summer of last year. Uh, Uyala is a leading uh, online video platform. Uh, we have customers from major uh, media companies such as ESPN. Uh, we have a lot of uh, video data and we have multiple teams using the data every day for different purposes. Uh, although they have different goals, um, they all share the same, uh, some common set of uh, tasks and operations they need to do like every day. Uh, for example, they need to create jobs, they need to track the jobs, um, sanity check the jobs uh, before it is run, and also they need to collect back the results uh, when the job is done. So our, our vision uh, for the job server is to try to uh, create, uh, to make Spark uh, as a service and also make it easy to use, uh, as easy as possible for multiple teams. Um, to do that, uh, we designed job server to support uh, RESTful API. Um, it means that it will be very easy for uh, any programming language to use the job server and integrate with the job server. Um, you can uh, run the job in the job uh, independent uh, Spark contest, uh, or you can uh, have multiple jobs to share the same contest. And if multiple jobs are sharing the contest, that means like you can take advantage of the high performance and low latency uh, RDD caching. Job server can also work uh, with uh, Spark streaming. Uh, it can also work with any Spark config, such as uh, standalone uh, cluster <coughs> or uh, Meso. Uh, job server can help you to uh, proceed your application jars, your job history, and uh, job configuration. It supports both uh, async and synchronous uh, API, and uh, the job results are returned in uh, uh, JSON format back to the caller. And the best thing is uh, it is open source. Uh, we welcome feedback and contribution from the community. So how to use the job server and create jobs? Uh, it is very easy. You just need to include uh, two lines in your build.spt, uh, one for the resolvers and the other one for the, for the library. Uh, then you assemble your application into a jar and upload the jar to the job server. Uh, this is an this is example of a uh, job server job. Uh, you just need to extend the, uh, the tray. It is called spot job and then override two methods. Uh, one for uh, sanity check for validation, and then the other one is, uh, is for uh, running the job, actually containing your application logic. So the idea of the job validation is to have some kind of like quick uh, sanity check. You can uh, check your input parameter, uh, you can check the configuration or uh, the the, the environment that you are running to make sure everything is fine before the job is actually running. Uh, if the check fail, uh, it will immediately uh, return the error back to the caller. Uh, in the job server, it is not the job to create a Spark contest. It is the job server to create and manage the Spark contest. 
um, you can, when you run the job, you can uh, specify saying that, hey, I want to run this job in a independent Spark context, or you want to run it in a shared context. And, and a nice idea is like, um, you can use this to, for debugging purpose. Uh, you can upload a dialogic job uh, to the context you want to debug, and then have the job uh, to dump out all the information about that context and all the information about the RDD. So, um, because it support the RESTful API, uh, you just need to create some uh, JSON request uh, to upload your jar. Uh, you specify uh, where is your jar and what is your application name, and then you submit the JSON request. To run the job, similarly, you create a JSON request by specifying the, um, the class name uh, to specify the input string, if there's any. Also, you can say that it is a synchronous job. And if it is a synchronous job, then the job will return immediately, uh, and the result is in JSON format. You can also use a synchronous API, and you can track the job status uh, using the job status route. And the job status information include uh, what is the context being used, how long the job is running, and what is the job ID. Hey, thanks, Kelvin. Um, so, let's, so now you guys have gotten a sense of the basic workflow. Let's dive into a specific example uh, of uh, using the job server to, uh, to, to provide a fast query service on top of Spark. So what are some considerations if we want to provide a kind of a, a, a query engine on top of Spark? Um, some considerations is that uh, you want the jobs to run in under a second, probably well under a second, so that it can serve, for example, a web route. And um, we would like to pass in the parameters for the query as a job config. So uh, like every other job server job, we, we can post the uh, query parameters as a JSON blob or, uh, or as a configuration blob. Um, and we really want to minimize uh, the overhead of, so normally when you run a Spark job that runs a long, long time, uh, you create a separate application that has a, its own Spark context. The problem with using this model for queries is that it takes kind of a couple seconds, depending on whether you're running on locally or on a cluster. In fact, on a cluster, it takes longer. Um, because every time you create a context, it has to create executor processes. So that's a pretty large overhead. You don't want to do that for every query, obviously. So the strategy instead is to uh, have a shared context and to cache your RDDs. Oh, that, that's one way you can do it, to cache your RDDs so that you can have a very low latency. Right. Um, so what that looks like is uh, we have a job server, which is a REST service. And uh, the first thing is we're going to create a, there's a REST route that can create a context. And when you do that, that creates the executors. The next step is that we're going to run a job to load uh, data into um, the, the cache of the context. In, in our case, we loaded it from Cassandra, and the data is then cached as uh, cached RDD. After you do that, then you can actually submit query jobs that run, run uh, Spark transformations, uh, or you know, soon you'll be able to run them as uh, Spark SQL. Uh, and that will return the results uh, as uh, JSON blob. And you can do that again and again. Um, so sharing uh, data between uh, jobs, that's, there's one thing that the Spark uh, job server helps is that uh, it gives you a, a nicer uh, thread safe API for um, being able to share uh, and your cache RDDs. Like it's the Spark native interface, uh, which actually we helped improve, uh, doesn't give you very much. It basically like Spark is designed so that you can um, cache RDDs and refer them by variable name. But obviously that doesn't work because when you have different uh, types of jobs, you can't just pass variables back and forth. So instead, what we've created is a kind of like a map with a name string. So you can save your RDDs uh, through some kind of string. Then you can retrieve it through a string API uh, in another job. And it takes care of concurrency so that if two jobs are trying to create the same thing, they don't step on each other. And uh, we'll, uh, so, so, that, so that's one thing we've uh, contributed that uh, will help a lot. Um, if you would like details on the, um, how the concurrency works, can feel free to, to talk uh, to us afterwards. Um, so using it in production, um, we uh, persist, as Kelvin had mentioned, we persist uh, job status, the job configuration, so that you can 
easily look back on, you know, something failed, you can look back and say, hey, you know, how did I configure this job? What caused it to fail? Uh, as well as uh, we persist the jar so that you can easily run the same things again. And, and that's all persisted to a database. Uh, you can, so you can choose, is this a DDBC URL? You can choose whatever database you like to use for doing this. And you can even share uh, the database across multiple instances of a job server for XJ purposes. Uh, defaults to H2. Um, and it also includes the project, it includes a full suite of, it includes like deploy scripts uh, as well as uh, modeling and metrics routes. Some um, really uh, quick uh, lessons uh, or challenges that we hit when we developed this. Uh, we had the initial, when we developed this, this was actually Spark 0.7, 0.8. Um, Getting multiple Spark contexts to run on a single JVM is, uh, was, was somewhat challenging. It's, I think it's a bit easier now with Spark 0.9 because Spark grew a, a real configuration system. Uh, but there's some tricks there. There's some tricks with running um, the sa multiple jobs at the same time on the same context. Uh, but we've looked at both of those. Um, finally, like uh, Spark is oriented around the concept of context. But um, the, what the job server does is it changes that concept to the, the idea of jobs, which is different than, because uh, what we're trying to say is that, just like for queries, there are situations where you want jobs to be independent of context. So, so we're kind of provide a different level, which might be a lot more suitable for certain applications. Uh, finally, some future plans. Um, I'll just quickly focus on one of them. Um, there's, there's a lot that we can do with this project. But um, one idea that we would like to uh, do at some point is to have an XA and a hot failover jobs. As many people know, the Spark context is a single point of failure uh, in the Spark stack. Um, now, if you have something like a job server, what you can do is use the checkpointing mechanism uh, in a Spark context to uh, save that to some stor persistent storage, say HDFS. And uh, what the job server then can do is it can coordinate and have, say, a backup context that is on standby and to be able to read that uh, and fill over to it if one dies. Um, so th that's the kind of thing that uh, you, can, you can do when you have a bit more infrastructure around. I uh, want to thank you, uh, big, big thanks to the Spark community. It is a really awesome community. We've already seen um, quite a number of contributions to the project already and like, definitely like to uh, see you coming. Um, and I'll skip over architecture slides. It, the, the design is completely asynchronous, built upon actors, but if you're really interested, I can tell you all about it. Uh, thank you very much. Oh, I guess, I guess we're running the question Q&A session. Um, so maybe we'll take, I don't know. Hmm? I think it is uh, six o'clock. We're like kind of out of time, but we can pick questions afterwards. Uh, um, yeah.